When all is said and done with this commemoration this week, I hope you'll all find yourself inspired to visit us at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in Boston. And when you do, when you wind your way through the museum of our moonshot, you'll end up at our moonshot exhibit and find a simple one-page memo from President Kennedy tucked away in the corner of the room. It's one of my favorite documents in all of our holdings. It's dated April 20th, 1961, exactly three months to the day from President Kennedy's inauguration. In it, the president fires off five numbered questions to his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. Do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory in space? How much additional would it cost? Are we working 24 hours a day on existing programs? If not, why not? If not, will you make recommendations to me as to how work can be speeded up? In building large boosters, should we put our emphasis on nuclear, chemical, or liquid fuel, or a combination of this three? Are we making maximum effort? Are we achieving necessary results? Eight days later, Vice President Johnson responded with a six-page memo that concluded, we are neither making maximum effort nor achieving necessary results. Less than one month later, President Kennedy delivered a special message on urgent national needs, asking for an additional $7 billion to $9 billion over the next five years for the space program. One year later, he committed the nation to landing a man on the moon before the end of a decade. In doing so, he mobilized 400,000 people around the country toward the goal, and seven years later, in one of the greatest achievements in human history, two astronauts walked on the moon. But in fact, landing on the moon was just the beginning of what the space program delivered. It advanced miniaturized computing, satellite navigation technology, and much of the technology that would later become the internet. A little scarily. <laughs> and perhaps most profoundly, it inspired a generation to dream big and bold and dedicate their lives to science, engineering, progress, and exploration. Our next guest embodies that spirit, striving to not only innovate in his own life's work, but to accelerate the pace of progress for humankind. Patrick Collison is co-founder and CEO of Stripe, a technology company that builds financial infrastructure for the internet business. Patrick and his brother John started Stripe in 2001 with the goal to make accepting payments on the internet simpler. Today, millions of businesses, from fast-growing startups like OpenAI to global enterprises like Ford and Amazon, are building on Stripe infrastructure. But that's just his day job. During COVID, Patrick helped create Fast Grants, which offered up to $500,000 grants for COVID-19-related research with decisions in just under, in under 14 days. And last year, he co-founded ARC, a research institute that is pioneering a new model for biomedical research. I'm also delighted to welcome Lance Pritchett, Lant Pritchett to our program today. Lant is a development economist, economist from the great state of Idaho in the United States. He worked for the World Bank from 1988 to 2007, living in Indonesia and India, taught at the Harvard Kennedy School, and was a research director at Oxford's Blavatnik School of Government. Having now thrice retired, he's currently visiting professor at the London School of Economics and the co-founder and research director of Labor Mobility Partnerships. Please join me in welcoming Patrick and Lant to the stage. Well, I'm really pleased to be here as a moderator. Uh, uh, I'm rarely invited to be a moderator. I'm nor much more as an extreminator. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I hope in this conversation we draw out some of the extremes we've used to make it, it I think, sometimes makes it things clearer. Uh, I'd like to start by... I, and by, by the way, just to kind of set context for this here, you know, you were just uh, you were just introduced as you know a, a development economist. Like I, I would say, um, Lant is the development <laughs> economist. Um, and uh, and while I think you were press ganged into this task of moderating, I'm going to try to turn the tables a little bit uh, along. We're going to make it a rap battle sort of situation and uh, inter interject with a couple of questions in your direction. Okay. Uh, and I, in the introduction, I did teach at a school called the Kennedy School. And we used to 
comment that it was the Harvard Business School, the Harvard Law School, but it was the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, aren't I mic'd up already? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, and so every year at graduation, and it was, we actually did Kennedy. Uh, it wasn't just a government school, it was a Kennedy school. And so every year at graduation, we would play uh, segments of, Har of John Kennedy's speeches. And so I want to emphasize it's a moonshot, but there were several simultaneous moonshots. And I think one of the reasons Kennedy is remembered as a leader is that there was, there was the moonshot of going to the moon. Uh, but in the is inaugural, he also speech, he also said, the U.S. is ready to pay any price, bury Burton, support any friend, to support the cause of liberty. So there was a moonshot about preserving a vision of liberty. Uh, he famously said, ask not what, you can, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So it was a moonshot of commitment to public purpose and optimism about public purpose. And he was, there was a moonshot of uh, the Four Freedoms, which F. Uh, Roosevelt had originally introduced, he had re-emphasized the commitment to freedom from the Four Freedoms, which included freedom from want. And so, as a development economist, I was always pleased that one of the moonshots was concerned about a sort of uh, improving the standards of living of people on the planet. So, I want to start with the moonshot analogy, but. Uh, some years ago in the Atlantic magazine, you wrote a, I think, justly very famous piece articulating that the science, that the progress or the productivity in science has gone way down because the pace of progress is actually about the same, but only by devoting 10 to 100 times more resources to it. So instead of most people seeing progress as uh, accelerating, you're actually emphasizing that the, pay, the productivity in the progress of science is slowing. Yeah, so um, well, I think we actually got a, 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 um, a perfect segue uh, to this point from the introduction, where the moonshot, the moonshot started, the, the moon moonshot, uh, the lunar moonshot, uh, started, first of all, with an honest and kind of discerning assessment of where, you know, where we stood and how things were going. You know, Sputnik launched in 57, and so like, the US was already doing space stuff, uh, but what was required to kind of initiate you know, with, with the program with real vigor um, was, uh, sort of was, was taking stock and observing that you know, we, as, uh, as Johnson reported to the president, uh, that we were not quite on track. Um, and so you know, science, as pr pretty much everyone here knows, is, uh, is the, like, the, the, the single primary reason as to why you know, we live the prosperous lives uh, that we all get to benefit from you know, as compared to those of you know, centuries before us and you know, why we're not dying at, uh, at age 30, um, as we heard, and the source of our penicillin and everything else. And so I think an important question just for us as a, a civilization, as a society, is, well, like, how is that project going? Like, you know, how well are we sciencing? Um, how, should we, how should we even kind of begin to think about that question? And I, I, maybe we have kind of some subconscious sense that things are, you know, kind of metastatic in the sense that, you know, science is a roughly kind of constant thing, and it just, you know, produces discoveries, you know, every now and again that we benefit from. But when you kind of look underneath the covers a little bit, it actually turns out that sort of science today, as compared to science 50 years ago, as compared to you know, science 100 years ago, et cetera, et cetera, is actually this radically transforming system. And that in particular, say, science today, as compared to science even just half a century ago, is almost unrecognizably different in its, uh, in its kind of basic qualities. And what I mean by that is there are now, roughly speaking, you know, two orders of magnitude, so 100x more practicing scientists today. Uh, than there were in, uh, in say, 1960. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, like a, a 2x change is a big change. Like a 100x change uh, is, uh, is, is, is pretty transformative. Like that is larger than the population difference between, you know, Ireland and the US. So, you know, two orders of magnitude is a big deal. Um, second, uh, you know, kind of concomitant with that, uh, if you look at kind of the, the course out, outputs of science, number of papers, number of journals, number of patents, number, you know, kind of choose your thing, whatever kind of mass metric you're using, you know, those have correspondingly uh, also increased by, by you know, about the same, uh, about the same factor. Um, and so I think kind of an obvious question to ask then is like, okay, we're kind of, we're doing, to, uh, actually, sorry, the last thing I should say is, and the, um, the amount of funding we're kind of deploying towards science uh, is, is also up by, you know, uh, uh, again, roughly 100x. Like the, the federal government didn't even become the majority funder of U.S. science uh, until the 60s. 
Um, so, th so I think an obvious question to then ask is like, okay, we're doing way more stuff. Like so many more people are you know, devoting their lives to expanding uh, and sort of you know, pushing out the frontier of knowledge. You know, how's that going? Um, and, and, you know, well, the, the sort of the punchline is there's no single metric we can look at. Like, you know, how do you measure science? But I think there are some suggested things we can look at. Um, so one is we can just look at, you know, what economists call TFP, total factor of productivity, which is, you know, you can kind of decompose economic growth into, you know, how much is it about, you know, people are working longer hours, how much is it about, you know, there are just like more people, and how much is, you know, the people are sort of more efficient in doing, you know, useful things with their time. And so you, you can measure this. It's, it's called TFP. And uh, uh, TFP, the, the rate of, uh, of, of TFP growth uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in most major economies, we can maybe look at the US as kind of the, the most common case, but the same thing is true in Europe, uh, it, w it was not that great around the turn of you know, the 20th century. It sort of increased until it reached a peak around 1970. And since then, you know, it's wriggled around a little bit, but it's been on this kind of trend of gradual decline. And so we're, not get, you know, we're, we're getting productive slower <laughs> than we were 50 years ago, even though we're like doing way more of the science stuff. Um, you know, the second thing we can look at, you know, there, there, are, there are some kind of more specific papers uh, in, kind of, uh, in the, the field of you know, innovation economics, uh, and we were just discussing maybe the, the single best and most famous one. This paper was published in 2016 um, by uh, Chad Jones and, um, and Nick Bloom and uh, two other co-authors, where they tried to look like narrowly, where if you, if, you, if you look at the, kind of the amount of R&D effort in different fields, you know, how many agronomists are there you know, trying to cook up new crops, or you know, how many scientists are there you know, working in the pharmaceutical industry trying to you know, concoct new drugs, and so forth. And so they, they take a bunch of different sort of specific sectors, and they try to look at kind of the intensity of the research effort, and you know, how, much, like, how many more new wheats are we getting, how many uh, new drugs, uh, and so forth, or new materials. Um, and uh, they conclude, similarly, that we're seeing um, um, uh, an exponential decline in the per-person productivity um, uh, in the sort of R&D in these sectors. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you can look at, so something we did for, for this piece is we, uh, we surveyed scientists. Uh, and again, you know, obviously the self-assessment is, is not, not a perfect metric, but you know, it's, it's something. Um, and uh, you know, in particular, we asked scientists across a bunch of different fields, chemistry, um, uh, physics, and, uh, and biology, uh, to, to take stock of you know, the Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, and you, you would think if, we're, like, if the kind of per person productivity is constant, you would think that, well, you know, that there's 100x more amazing you know, things happening. So we're probably producing better things now you know, than we were in the past. Um, and, uh, and so we, we ran this, this, this survey, and basically what you see is it's kind of hard to discern a definitive trend, but you certainly don't see this, again, this crazy you know, increase, this improvement in the quality of what we're generating. And so, you know, I don't want to go on kind of too long at this point, but I, th I think the sort of basic intuition to go away with is we're, we're working way harder. We are pedaling, you know, on the, on the science peloton. We have, uh, we have turned it up by a factor of 100. We're working so hard. And by every available metric, it seems that we are you know, somewhere between kind of constant in our total useful output to maybe even, there's some suggestions that it might be kind of in its, in its total impact slightly declining. And, uh, and you know, in as much as this is true, I think it should concern us uh, for you know, a whole host of obvious reasons where, well, one, you know, um, you know, the world is, I think, safe to say you know, in this moment, uh, it's even more, I think, safer to say now than when we wrote the piece in 2018, the world is not perfect. Um, and, uh, and so there are, there are lots of problems left to solve, you know, most of which science will be uh, an important uh, component in any solution too. Um, and, uh, and you know, at, at a distributional level, you know, while you know, pretty much everyone here lives a pretty prosperous life, certainly you know, relative to most people in the world, um, you know, the world as a whole is nowhere near as prosperous uh, as it needs to be for everybody to live a life that you know, we would uh, deem um, uh, sort of acceptable or desirable. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we collectively uh, need a lot more sophistication in order to bring that about. And so I think in as much as this uh, characterization is true, we need to figure out how to, uh, how to make the science stuff work better. Now, making science... Do, do, do you agree with any of that? What? Do you agree with any of that? Uh, <laughs> I agree that that's a remarkably... It's a view that isn't expressed that I think is correct in the sense that I think everybody particularly given the visibility of the tech, by which we mean just ICT, I think people vastly overestimate the pace of progress. If you ask, what's one thing that nearly every professional economist thinks that nearly no one else thinks? It's that productivity is slowing. 
most people think productivity is going more rapidly now than it was in the past, and that's just, by the way, economists measure productivity. That's just not true. And we have measured, we have maintained constant roughly per capita growth rates in the advanced world uh, with less factor productivity generated by enormously more effort. So yes, I think that's roughly correct. One question, and again, back to the moonshot metaphor, is, is this just declining productivity of the effort into research just an inevitable consequence of we worked out some basic things. So people often use, they say, well, it's not rocket science to imply that it's complicated. My son is a physicist. He says, I can teach you rocket science in an afternoon. Rocket science is actually really pretty simple. And the slides that I think uh, Linda Doyle showed uh, showed that most of the problems uh, of getting a man to the moon in the back were not science problems, they were engineering problems. There was no fundamental scientific breakthroughs about our understanding of the world necessary. We understood delta, delta V, yeah. <laughs> kind of Newton worked out rocket science in a <laughs> crude sense, and then we had to work out the engineering of applying that to, to accomplish this, but the returns to engineering on the same fundamental science might just be declining. Right. So all of that comes back to a question of when you think about the reason for the decline in productivity, is it just that we've been doing engineering on the same stock of science and the returns are diminishing? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, yeah. So there is a basic question of, you know, have we just plucked the low-hanging fruit and we have to kind of climb further up the tree uh, in, order to, uh, in order to kind of access new discoveries and knowledge? And, and there is some, you know, if you, if you uh, look at some of the kind of the, the um, specific phenomena in science itself, I think you see some evidence to support this view. And so, for example, the average age of no, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists, <laughs> if you look specifically at the age at which they did the work, so not when they won the prize, but the age where they did the work, and that is kind of shifting to the right. They are getting older. Now, again, you could tell multiple stories in response to that, but you know, one story you could tell is you have to kind of accumulate more knowledge before you can uh, do something novel at the frontier. Um, and there's, 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 you know, uh, it's also the case that the average um, number of co-authors on scientific papers is, is getting larger. Again, a story you could tell is, uh, is it's kind of harder for any single individual to kind of, you know, themselves internalize all the knowledge required to, to make the discovery. Um, maybe, but um, so. Um, the thing I was sort of come back to is uh, I, I think you know as, as we think about this question, we have to continually keep in mind that we radically transformed the structure of science over the course of the last fifty years. And so, if you had something that was working, you know, well, we had some level of per person productivity in the sixties. I won't call it you know necessarily well in an absolute sense, but just like it was working you know to, to some degree. And then, if we radically change that system, and now we're, we observe that it's working less well per person, I think you know it would be somewhat you know lacking in humility of us to assume, well, that's just how knowledge is. Uh, <laughs> like you know, well, the, may, maybe it's how we're doing it. Um, and uh, here, so, so in, in the U.S., um, uh, although similar dynamics apply in Europe, uh, uh, the, uh, the the largest uh, uh, funding body for science is the uh, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, it spends about forty five billion a year on uh, on on you know basic medical science. Um, you know, by comparison, the, the National Science Foundation, uh, the NSF, uh, which is the other main federal funding body, uh, spends about twelve billion a year, and so you know the, the very significant majority uh, is tilted towards biomedical research. And within that, you can go back and you can look at what, um, so, so, so James Shannon was the Irish-American um, administrator who, uh, who oversaw the, uh, the expansion of the NIH uh, in, the, uh, in the late 50s and 60s, uh, so when it kind of went from this sort of little backwater to this sort of preeminent funding body. And it's very interesting to look at what he said about sort of how to fund science well. He said it was so, and this is, you, know, you can read stuff that he wrote in the 50s, he said it's so important that we ensure that scientists are sort of uninhibited in the research agendas uh, uh, they can pursue. That, you know, it's not these bureaucratic committees you know, rendering judgment as to you know, that which is worthy of pursuit, but instead they have to have their own in, uh, autonomy and independence. Um, uh, he, uh, he said there was so, like, there'd be such a temptation as the federal government became a bigger funder of science um, towards kind of uh, um, you know, bu bureaucracy and, and sort of just you know, temporal imposition where people are spending more of their time filing reports and you know, jumping through hoops and sort of all the rest. And you know, he, he, he said that it was very critical to avoid that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he be, <laughs> something I, I wish somebody would do is to sort of uh, go through the failure modes that James Shannon enumerated and to survey scientists <laughs> uh, against them today, 
over, over the course of Fast Grants, which is this program we ran um, during COVID, um, you know, that, that kind of got us in touch with it. We, we funded about uh, roughly 200 different labs. And, uh, and we did run a survey um, uh, among the, uh, the, the scientists that Fast Grants funded. And we asked them just a very simple question, uh, which is, forget your COVID work. Just in normal times, um, uh, if you could spend your current research budget however you want, how much would your research agenda change? So this was not increasing their budget. This was just giving them flexibility in how they spend their current budget. We give them three options. Uh, would, they, would they change what they do? Um, not at all. Would they change it a little? Or would they change it a lot? 78% of the respondents told us that they would change their research agenda a lot. Uh, and so if we're observing, again, at this kind of you know, total system level that... Um, that, uh, that sort of the purpose and productivity is declining, and the scientists themselves are sort of, you know, you know gurgling, drowning in, uh, in, in sort of, you know, various stymieing, you know, limitations. Again, I, it could be true, but I think it's premature for us to just shrug and say, well, just, you know, knowledge, knowledge is hard. Uh, and, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of, there's more kind of interesting history here where the, 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 there were various attempts to kind of systematize and to structure and to sort of build, you know, big funding bodies for science early in the 20th century before, you know, Vannevar Bush um, and, you know, proposed the, what became the NSF and so on. And the scientists resisted it. And I think that's very interesting, uh, you know, where you know, there were proposals around, you know, would you like free money? Um, and, uh, and the scientists, you know, ran a, a, an aggressive campaign to stop that happening. <laughs> um, uh, but again, I think they had some sense that, well, not that it's intrinsically bad, uh, but that it's fraught and it's very important that we get it right. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, certainly if... Um, anonymously and privately surveyed, um, uh, many scientists would tell you that um, you know, some of the failure modes might have come to pass. So I think you've alluded to this uh, FAST grants, mm. which was an initiative that you and some others undertook to get money to scientists very rapidly in the context of COVID, because it was clear in the context of COVID, and again, I want to refer back to the uh, notion of an aligned versus a messy kind of world, that uh, I think COVID did in some sense align the world uh, in a very, that scientists realized whatever I was working on, if it's if even marginal relevance to COVID, I probably should shift it in the COVID direction. And so this fast grants of yours enabled that, but which raises again the question about the production of knowledge uh, as a professional producer of knowledge myself, there's often a disciplinary logic that can wander away from any socially importance logic. Uh, and I wonder what, what the lessons of the moonshot kind of activity produce in coalescing si science around progress in an in a impact in the world sense versus a narrow progress of my career within the existing structure of science sense. So what did you, is that, I mean, I, you've written a little, a nice little piece about what you learned from this Fast Grants experience. Is that one of the lessons that maybe having a prioritization device imposed from the outside, either by a kind of political uh, mechanism of leadership or by the real world uh, 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 creating a pandemic, would be beneficial for the progress getting faster, better, sooner? Yeah, I think, um, look, I, I, I think there's a natural tendency in all organizations. And I don't want to sound, you know, in commenting on organizations, um, sanctimonious for, you know, any, any of the dynamics I'm about to describe, I see at Stripe. Uh, so um, I think there's a natural tendency to become kind of self-referential and, uh, and kind of, um, and, you know, hermetic. Uh, in, in, in you know, your, your value systems, what you're focused on, and sort of you know, who we're all performing for and so forth. And so, yes, I, I think that in the case of the moonshot, you know, it's very, um, it's kind of hard to, um, it's hard to fake, right? I mean, contra the various YouTube channels. But, um, but like, you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty fundamental question of like, are you on the moon or not? Um, and, uh, and, you know, is, uh, you know, is the, does the, does the dec leading digit of the decade end in a six or not? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, that's, I think, very clarifying. And it's very, you know, I'm sure you, know, you could otherwise be spinning a story as to how we're, you know, we're deepening our lunar epistemology, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, 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 are we on the moon or not? And, uh, and, uh, and you know, I think for companies,
companies, it's helpful, you know, when we get too distracted and, you know, stuck in the clouds, you know, some customer will come along and, you know, knock us over the head and, you know, ask us, well, why do I not have the thing yet? Uh, and, you know, that's, that, that can be, you know, sometimes our version of it. Um, and it was striking, and, and look, I, I don't want to sound, you know, while I may be observing some pathologies or challenges in kind of the scientific domain, you know, I don't want to sound too critical of these or um, funding organizations because, you know, it's a hard job and no organization is perfect, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it was, I, I guess the way I'd phrase it is it was striking how difficult, like, it wasn't the case that the people at any other funding body didn't know what should be done. It was somehow they were embedded in a structure that made it very hard to do. And so by doing fast grants, you know, we, we were no more enlightened or, or capable or, you know, anything than any of thousands of other people. Um, uh, I think we were somewhat unique in our kind of institutional circumstances uh, where you know, we were able to pull some things together in a way that was challenging for them, which maybe does raise the collective question of like, okay, uh, how might we you know, elevate the, uh, the agency um, of you know, specific individuals within these organizations so they can you know, adapt as faster uh, you know, when, when the need arises? Um, and I think that's, I think that's, a, that's, a, I think that's a, you know, a, a deep and important question. Uh, I, I want to ask you this question, actually. So, um, so okay, you are... Get my mic up fast. <laughs> exactly, yes. So, well, uh, you know, it seems to me... You, you're an economist. Uh, an economist. The, um, uh, it seems to me that the sort of the, the most basic... Um, I guess there's probably a couple of questions you could propose are kind of the most basic question in economics, but among the most basic questions in economics would be, you know, I am a poor country, and I would like to be a rich country. Um, and, you know, uh, around you know, JFK's visit to Ireland, of course, you know, thanks to... T.K. Whitaker and others, you know, th that is, you know, his visit was close to, um, you know, the, the commencement of the, you know, incredible um, uh, process of, uh, of growth and heightening prosperity that, that, you know, Ireland subsequently benefited from. And so, how, how well do you think economics addresses this question? Like, if the, if the you know, the prime minister of, uh, of, you know, some country with a GDP per capita comes to you, uh, with a GDP per capita of, say, $10,000, comes to you and says, you know, we're at 10000 we would like to be at 40000 we observe that the correlation between, you know, self-reported well-being and GDP per capita is, like, 0.7, <laughs> and so we think that, you know, growing GDP is going to be a super good thing for our people. Um, there's a big economics literature you know, is there, is there an obvious set of prescriptions that you can provide for me? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I am relatively optimistic, I think, among economists in answering that yes. Um, but that said, I'm a realist in acknowledging, uh, and I think it was the, uh, one of the past presidents of the... Um, EU who said, we all know what to do, we just don't know how to do it and get reelected. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so there is, and, and my answer is going to end with the question I was going to ask to you. So I think there are in fact a number of ways in which the ways in which governments interact with the economy shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, and just so there's, first of all, just stopping, you know, if you're shooting yourself in the foot, stop pulling the trigger. That's rel it would seem like relatively straightforward advice, but in many ways, um, you know, not doing things that are counterproductive economically, they're often things that are actually very productive politically, uh, and so I'm not saying this is easy, but I do think that yes, there are some things we can tell you that nearly reliably every country that has embarked on a trajectory of radically transforming prosperity has done, and you're not doing it. Okay, so that, that I think. Now, the, the more, the thing about uh, economics is, the more granular you get, I think the less likely we are to be helpful. We're, we're much better on direction and big picture and less helpful on the granularity. And 
all implementation happens at a granular level. So I think that gets very complicated. So do I get to ask a sub part of my question before you I, then ask? I, well, I want to get back. Let, let me ask the all question right. I was going to ask, um, which was, you, in addition to writing about the, re, the re, reduction in the rate of progress, or the product, not at the rate of progress, but the productivity of science, You've written a very interesting piece with a co another economist academic, Tyler Cohen, about the science of progress. And so I want to sort of ask a two-part question. One is, I was very excited about the notion of a science of progress, but the two-part question is, how much of your idea of the science of progress is the science of progress of science? We, in some sense, need a disciplinary field that is looking at understanding these questions about research productivity of science, and how much you see a science of progress as being a science of human cooperation. Because I think the essence, of, as an economist, the essence of prosperity is human cooperation, uh, and, and the progress of our knowledge of the physical world has contributed to that. But in some sense, our production of the knowledge of the physical world in yeah. part was the result of right. uh, improvements in human cooperation. So how much of is the science of progress, in your view, is, is the science of progress of science? And how much of the science of progress would be a science of how human beings cooperate to produce progress? <laughs> I think it's... Um... I think it depends on your margin, right? Um, uh, in that, if you're like, if you're in the U.S., it might be uh, it might be more about the science of progress of science. Uh, but if you're um, but if you're uh, if you're in India of 1970, I think the first order of business, or indeed the Ireland of 1960, the first order of business is to reconstitute society so that it's closer to you know, the, the U.S. of then, or indeed the sort of the U.S. of today. So I, I see them as, as, as maybe sequenced in that sense. I mean, look, I, I think it's really striking that, um, I mean, again, just to, to, to kind of use the Irish example here, I mean, um, it, it's, it, it sort of goes without saying uh, uh, how, um, you know, how much we have benefited from fixing the, um, the self-imposed, um, you, know, uh, you know, causes of, uh, of poverty, uh, that you know held us back for you know much of um, uh, our development up until the 60s, 70s, kind of thereabouts, um, and you know that didn't require. I mean, it was the same people, right? Uh, uh, Ireland's development happened you know, over the course of you know depending on how exactly you count it, you know within a, a generation or two, and so it's not like we like fundamentally reimagined ourselves as people. Now there were you know meaningful social changes and so forth. Um, but uh, but it was it was the same society, uh, uh, and so I think that shows that you know with a, a given population of people, you know it, it is possible to reconfigure some practices, to adapt some policies, etc., uh, in a way that uh, that can be you know really meaningful. And you know Ireland's well, it's a very conspicuous example. It's not the only example, uh, of course. Um, and, and you know I I, I suppose I. Having said all that, I, I have updated maybe in the in the direction that that kind of you're describing, where it's um, I don't know for, for for me there are just all these mysteries that sort of the uh, the the really basic um, kind of course economic analyses uh, I, I I you know I, I find it difficult for them to sort of uh, to be fully explanatory where uh, you know. Uh, Folks here flown on any of the uh, the Japanese airlines um, any of the last you know couple of years? Put your hands, A and A or Japan Airlines. Okay, a couple of people I see at the back. And um, so, um, so you fly in these airlines, and you're like, you know, this is just like a very pleasant experience. Uh, and you know, not uh, I live in the U.S. and you know, noticeably more pleasant than you know flying on United and Delta. Uh, <laughs> And you know, you, you you ask yourself, well, you know, why? And again, I suppose the, the 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 kind of the simplistic explanation is, well, you know, people like whatever it is, you know, the the the, the food or the cleanliness or the, you know whatever, yeah, whatever the the, the timeliness indeed. Um, and uh, and you're like, well, they're they're spending more. They have more, you know, surplus capacity. They are investing more in cleaning. They are spend, you know, they've higher food, you know, um, uh, cost of goods, etc. And so I went and I looked at the P&Ls of, of these airlines, and as far as I can tell, on a per capita basis, the Japanese airlines are not spending more. Um, and so, you've, you know, like a meaningful difference in outcomes and outputs, but it's kind of hard to find in the sort of the, the basic structure of, you know, what they're actually doing. Um, 
uh, and so I think you're, you're, you're then drawn to kind of, okay, well, you know, are, are there other things going on here? Are there other sort of cultural explanations um, uh, and other dynamics afoot? And, you know, that's a kind of funny, you know, micro example. Um, but I think, you know, w whether it's something as prosaic and as simple as that or something as fundamental as, you know, what exactly happens in a country that enables this growth, I suspect, and look, I, you know, when, when we wrote this article, we, we said that, you know, the, the dynamics and mechanics of progress, you know, it's a very important question uh, that we should be sort of trying to answer. You know, we were, we were not stipulating answers, but, you know, uh, I, I suspect that those answers do substantially involve uh, reference to cultural factors. Uh, I don't know who exactly said this, because it's been attributed to various political leaders, but there is some political leader that said, when I heard the word culture, I reached for my gun. <laughs> uh, which I hesitate to use a bit, because I worry that he might have meant it literally. Uh, but I, I, I don't think... Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm very concerned about cultural explanations because part of my research on the process of economic growth in poor countries, and poor countries are poorer in part because they have much lower productivity and hence have available known, globally known technologies that they don't have to invent anything either in a, either in a scientific or even in an engineering sense to radically enhance productivity. What you notice about this is that uh, places have enormously rapid and then sustained accelerations at times. So you might think that the difference in current well-being of countries is because rich countries grew fast and poor countries grow slow. Well, that's kind of true, but the rich countries have just grown actually very slowly for a very long time and have been with, the, uh, with a few wars and great depressions, they've actually grown very steadily at 2% per capita. And if you go 2% per capita... Remarkably steadily. What? Remarkably yes, steadily. Yes. No, I mean, uh, I, I, the amazing fact is that if, if you want to predict Dutch or Danish GDP in 2020 on the basis of the growth rate of Danish GDP from 1890 to 1911, 100 years ahead, it, you're off by 3%. That's an amazing fact, which means the growth rate, the underlying growth rate over all of the transformations of the 20th century was constant in exponential terms. But exponential growth gives you exponential growth. So, but back to the culture point. The difference, what separates the rich countries and the poor countries, is the poor countries often have incredible bursts of growth made possible by being lagging, and so they are able to come together and produce doubling or tripling of GDP in less than a generation. So the scientific difficulty with that is if culture is this thing that is persistent and kind of is steady over time, that you acquire a culture then you have to have a theory in which, for a given culture, you can either have very rapid growth or very slow growth, but both are possible outcomes. Now, I, so which tends me to, uh, the, so I'm not against culture being important, but if you think of, you, you know, nearly every country that has had radically transformably rapid growth had people right just before that happened, explaining why this country in cultural terms was never going to have rapid growth. So I'm sure there were people writing about Ireland on the cusp of it becoming the Celtic tiger, saying the Irish, ah, the Irish this, the Irish that. In the 1950s, there was a whole body of work saying why the Japanese culture was inimical to modern economic growth. Korea in the 1960s, there were all kinds of reasons why Koreans were, you know, their culture was incompatible with growth. The Chinese, just before the Deng uh, reforms. So the difficulty with culture is that by, it sounds as if it's deterministic over the very long run, and it's easy to rationalize yourself into there's nothing we can do about this because it isn't, it's, 
uh, not in the culture, and then boom, you do some things that unleash the worst features of the way in which the economy works, and the people with the exact same culture can triple their GDP per capita, triple their productivity. So, yeah, so I mean, that's why I'm very leery. I, I, I never reach for a gun about anything, even though I am from the American West, so you might suspect me of that. But uh, I do reach for my rhetorical uh, counterexamples whenever I hear the word culture, because if you are a cultural determinist, it's very difficult to recognize cultural determinism on the long scale with what we actually see in country experiences, which are lots of very rapid explosive growth episodes happening in places that people are predicting can't succeed because of culture. You see why he's the development economist. Uh, so um, I, I, I submit um, humbly that, um, uh, that, that, that there are uh, two, two things that can be conflated. But I, I'm generally curious what you think here. So um, uh, there's, there's culture, as you, know, as you put it, um, uh, how it is that people coordinate and how people interact. And then there's kind of more deep roots uh, cultural determinism uh, around how sort of that which is the case in 1900 will, you know, with some degree of you know, rigidity predict that which is the case in 2000. And I think as, as you, you know, kind of uh, describe, the, the latter version of that, the cultural determinism, just doesn't fail empirical longitudinal backtesting. Like, it's, it's just not true. And, you know, we're here uh, in a place uh, and indeed at an event that's kind of a testament to its falsehood, right? Um, and then I think the, the sort of the question is, okay, how much of that which changes in you know Japan or in South Korea or in Taiwan or in Ireland or in Singapore, you know, or in any of these places that are uh, let's say over the course of the 20th century became examples of this rapid development, how much we should understand that as sort of mere changes in science policy or economic policy and you know so forth, and how much it's about um, uh, you know. Other, other categories and other kinds of changes? And I'll, I'll put that as a question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, as a development economist, I travel a lot, which meant when my children were small, I was away a lot. And I came back from a trip and had a 12-year-old daughter who said, Dad, what is it that you do? And I said, well, I was working for the World Bank. Well, I, we try and help countries accelerate their progress because we believe if they accelerate the progress, it'll lead to better well-being. I says, well, okay, that, that sounds good. Uh, but what do you tell countries to do? And I said, well, you know, we often look at successful countries and tell countries to do that. You know, imitate what other successful countries have done is likely. She said, I'm trying to explain it to a 12-year-old, and she's a very bright 12-year-old, so she says, well, like what? Said, well, the Koreans were very successful. And I, she said, okay, what did the Koreans do? And I said, look, if, if I could tell you that, I wouldn't be an expert, right? Uh, we don't really know that. So you've pushed me very quickly to what we do know from the data is it's possible to have success. What we also know from the data is that the Coral, you know, the association, the causation, the, cor the, the correlation of success with observed de jure policies is very weak. So it is not the case that simply adopting this or that well-known, easy to implement policy tends to be strongly associated with the episodes we see of growth acceleration. My, uh, sort of my preferred current working theory is that a lot of it has to do with a shared coalition, coalescence around a purpose and a vision of a path to success. Sounds an awful lot like culture to me. <laughs> Okay, they, if, if, <laughs> if that's what you mean by culture. But sure, absolutely. Many people, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, what many people mean by culture, again, is something longer, deeper, less having to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, um, and, and again, I, I think the point uh, the provost made about aligned versus messy, a lot of times when you see success, you get 
several powerful actors in the society, economy, nation who come into alignment about the need for progress in a way they weren't before. And that can be a political change, sometimes that's a dynamic leader, sometimes that's a crisis, there are lots of ways. And then once you have this coalescence around a sense of purpose, then they figure out what policies to implement in order to accomplish that. So there's a policy-driven view, and, and I think, again, as I get older and I've done more research and I've tried to understand success in more domains, I'm uh, becoming a bigger believer in a purpose-driven view, which is if you have a shared purpose, you figure out the policies to do to accomplish it. If you start from a policy that, oh, if you just do X, you'll be okay without having fully internalized the purposes for which you're doing X, I think you're unlikely to, ha to have success. And so, and so, okay, if, if I'm to sort of recast what you, you're saying, you, you let me know if this is a, a fair and accurate representation of your views. Are you saying that in as much as, um, uh, in as, much as culture is a kind of burden, and inherited intergenerational destiny and inner nature of the people and so forth, you're a skeptic and you think that fails empirical tests. And, in, you know, and conversely, if by culture one means something more hopeful and optimistic uh, and instead a set of, a set of collective choices uh, and a contingent way of doing things together, which can be kind of you know, de deliberately um, selected into and deliberately pursued, uh, then you think that's both you know, possible and importance and, you know, of relevance to a, to a JFK event. Definitely relevant to a JFK event, since we only have a minute 14 left on the clock. I'm glad we've come around to being relevant to a JFK event. <laughs> <laughs> you should be a moderator. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I do think, again, the, a moonshot kind of thing, or money, uh, the other moonshots that John F. Kennedy, the preservation of liberty, the freedom from want, the commitment, but the ask what you can do for your country is a prototypical example of let's coalesce around a set of purposes that we have as society and let's jointly contribute to them. I think without that, again, it doesn't have to be everyone, it doesn't have to be suppressive of other flourishing, and to some extent having a commitment to a diversity of flourishing is a very hard thing to maintain. But I was just, and using an ultimate, maybe tragic example, I was just in Rwanda. Rwanda's controversial for many reasons. It has a person who is legitimately called a dictator. But, you know, if you thought the culture of Rwanda was hatred between these ethnicities and it was an ingrained thing, that led to a genocide, then you would have been very pessimistic about the recovery of Rwanda from that genocide. In complete contrast, it's had some of the most amazing progress in all of Africa over the intervening 30 years since the genocide. And so, again, I have this, if I'm radically against the cultural determinists that people fail because it's in their nature to fail, and radically optimistic, but Rwanda had both one of the most tragic genocides ever and has recovered from it very rapidly. We can call both of those things culture, but then we're just headed towards how does one realign a society around purposes that are sufficiently shared that they see the benefits of human cooperation and succeeding the dark temptations of human, of the raised in the cyber presentation, the dark temptations of human society to not cooperate and have that embedded. And let me, our session is over, unless you want to say something. It sounds like, um, like pro, pro our clock doesn't go negative, so once we hit zero, it becomes less threatening. Progress has ceased. So, uh, no, um, uh, it sounds to me like um, um, we, um, we know that progress is important. Uh, you're making the case powerfully that uh, it's uh, that it's possible uh, th by shifting one's uh, one's um, I'm trying to avoid using the word culture, but let's say uh, uh, the the um, by the interaction the, by the patterns of interactions between people. Um, those can change. 
Exactly. And as to, you know, how best to do that, I guess we'll have to just come back for a round two. Yeah. <laughs>